Today we're going to be looking at the Sony InZone M9. It's the company's newest gaming monitor. Now Sony's marketing this as a gaming device and all the reviews that I've seen cover it as such and that's totally okay. That makes total sense and I think you should watch those videos. This video isn't going to cover every single aspect of the monitor. I'm instead going to focus on my needs for it, which are primarily using it with a Mac. See, I do have a Windows computer plugged into it and I use it for gaming. I have a PlayStation 5 plugged into it as well, but my main use case is editing videos for YouTube and doing my day job, both of which happen on Macs. So in this video, I wanted to explain why I think this is a pretty good monitor for people who want to get Apple Studio Display, but for whatever reason, can't really pull the trigger. Maybe it's price, maybe it's features or whatever. I think you should look at this monitor because it's pretty darn good. And let's be real, I'm a YouTuber who buys a lot of Apple products. I'm exactly the demographic who you would expect to justify spending $2,000 on a monitor that looks really nice on my desk. But in this video, hopefully I'll give you an idea for why the InZone M9 was so compelling to me and why the $900 price point really gives you a lot of bang for your buck, even if you're not gonna be using it for any gaming purposes. So let's start by looking at the design of the monitor. How's it gonna look on your desk? Now I will say I'm not using the built-in stand because I think the stand looks a little crazy and is super big and takes up a lot of space. I'm not a fan of that. But I've got it put up on a Visa arm and this is like a $20 arm off Amazon. I'll try to put a link in the description so you can check it out if you want a really cheap option that works great, honestly. Um, but yeah, it looks good. Uh, I think the bezels are nice and small. There's a very slight chin. There's no LEDs in your face on the front or anything, which is something I see on too many monitors. The only the only real distraction, I guess, is at the bottom left, there's a Sony logo, which is so faint, you really don't see it. It took me like a day to even notice it was there. And then on the bottom right, they do include an NVIDIA sticker that you can just pull off uh, because there's no need for you to advertise NVIDIA to yourself on your desk. Don't do that. When I go around the back, I do see it is pretty thick. Um, which is a little bit surprising, but is honestly fine because you don't see it in normal use. And I think it looks pretty nice. There is this giant LED bar on the back that's ugh, whatever. I don't really care. I just have it set to white and that's fine. Um, there's also a couple buttons back here. The sleep button is good and solid. The joystick is kind of, ugh, I don't really like it, but that's how you interact with the monitor to change inputs, to change menu options and everything that we'll get into in a second. Overall, I'm very happy with the design. It's not like the most beautiful thing in the world, but I think that even at other angles, like looking at it from behind, um, in front, it all looks pretty good. And I think legally I'm required to show the specs for the monitor at some point in the video, even if I'm not gonna dive deep onto them. So you should see them on screen here. I'll just say the monitor looks very, very good to my eyes and the matte coating is great for reflections. I basically get zero reflections on this monitor. Now let's jump into the display settings on the Mac to see what this monitor can do. And the great news is everything is here. So you can go ahead and change the resolution to anything that you'd like. I have it set to 1080p, which outputs at 4K, which is the perfect two to one pixel doubling that you want with Retina that gets you the crispest lines and looks just awesome. But if you want more space, you can change the logical resolution to something else. So the UI is smaller, it won't map as perfectly, but it'll still look pretty good. There's tons of color profiles. I would just leave it with the default one, but you can toy with this or set a custom one. Refresh rate, I was really happy to see that I can select any of the refresh rates available on the device, or I can set it to variable so it'll switch between whatever it needs to do at the current moment. That's really great. I wasn't expecting the variable refresh rate to necessarily be there. And rest assured, if you're playing games that do go over 60 hertz, the display will display up to 144 frames per second, which is super awesome. I would not recommend turning on the high dynamic range feature. Mac OS just looks terrible in HDR. I don't really understand how to use it well, so I just leave it turned off. And again, the display gets plenty bright, so you should be okay. And then rotation, there's no automatic rotation detection or anything here, so you just have to set it. In the settings, you'll most likely set it once and never have to touch this again. And then if you wanna change the settings of the monitor some more, you can go into this little nubbin, just press it in on the back, and then you can go into the settings. These are available in a Windows app as well, but I'm doing it on the Mac, so I'm just gonna do it through this menu. And yeah, this is what you can set. So you can set different picture modes. I would recommend standard if you're using it with a Mac or just general for general computing needs. FPS game, game one, game two, these are really exaggerated. Cinema's kind of muted. Honestly, standard seems to be the most color accurate, so that's what I would go with. Gaming Assist has a whole bunch of things you can do here that aren't going to be relevant for most Mac users, but you can set a crosshair to always show in the middle of the screen if you'd like. Uh, you can set a timer that'll show in the top right for anything from 10 to 60 minutes, and then it'll just hit zero. You kind of have to notice it. It doesn't make a noise or anything, so you just have to notice that it's zero and then kind of clear it away. You can use this for like a Pomodoro thing, or I'm not really sure what the purpose of this is, but it's here if you want it. 
There's a frame rate counter, which you can display in the top left, which shows the output of the display, not the frame rate of the game you're playing. So just keep that in mind, uh, but it's going to show you what the monitor is currently outputting at, which in macOS is usually 144 hertz, even if you have it on variable refresh. There's adaptive sync you can turn on and off. The response time you can reduce, which I think just reduces the video quality a little bit, but will give you a faster response if you're playing a uh, game that requires that. And black equalizer just raises the shadows on screen. If you turn that up, uh, zero is default, but one, two, and three will increase it a bit. Um, again, more for gaming stuff than actually using it as a normal computer. Picture adjustment, a lot of these are actually grayed out, um, but the brightness you can set, I usually use it as 50 in my well-lit office. Um, at 100, it's just insanely bright. I would not recommend it, but you can go that high. Uh, local dimming, I have it set to high. This is basically the 96 or whatever zones around the screen. You can make sure that all of those are used to give you the best HDR and just kind of like the darkest darks when the screen has like bright things on it so it's not all lit up. Um, so that's pretty nice. And then aspect ratio, just leave it as normal. You can also change inputs here. So there's two HDMIs, one display port, one USB-C, and you can decide whether you want to do control for HDMI, which is kind of uh, the thing where if you turn on a device, it'll turn on the monitor and that kind of like vice versa. Uh, you can also do auto select, which I actually turn off. I find the auto select on this to be a little annoying. Um, it doesn't switch away from things, but it likes to turn itself on and like search for things and it cycles through them all. It does like a weird thing. I don't like this a ton. So I leave auto select off and let myself just manually select the input. There are also some USB ports on the back you can do some KVM switching with, uh, so you can control that from here. Uh, audio, you can basically just control the volume of the audio from the speakers, which again is terrible, so I would not recommend using it. And you can personalize the power LED, which is on the side here, out of sight. Uh, I leave it on, but it doesn't really matter, you can't see it while you're using it. And then the rear lighting, you can change the color to anything, or you can turn it off if you'd like. And finally, there's the OSD menu where you can change the language of the menu we're going through right now. You can change the transparency and the timeout for it. And then there's just some other random things here in the others section. So that's the menu uh, software that's built into the InZone M9. So I said at the start of this video that the studio display from Apple is not the right display for me, and that's absolutely the case. But I do think there are people who it is for. I think it would be a good fit for you if you require 5K, if you really want a display that looks fantastic. I think it looks really, really good. I think it's gonna be good for you if you're only using it with Apple devices. And if your budget is okay spending upwards of $2,000 on a display, then it might be a good pick for you. So if all those are true for you, it's a good pick. But if any of those are not a good fit for you, then it's a little problematic. But those aren't my needs. My needs were different. And the big one for me, the one thing that really made the studio display absolutely a non-starter was the inputs, or I should say input. See, the studio display only has a single Thunderbolt input and that's it. You don't have any other options. There's no HDMI, there's no full-size display port, there's no USB-C only. It has to be Thunderbolt. So for me, my gaming PC and my PlayStation 5 literally would not work with this monitor. So it's a total non-starter for me. And yeah, just other things like high refresh rates were something that is important to me and the studio display just doesn't have. It's at a locked 60 hertz, which is fine, but it's not what I was looking for. And so you can spend a lot more money to get a really high quality display, or you can spend a lot less money and get a lower quality display. But I think that the $900 price point for the InZone M9 is really the sweet spot. It's much cheaper than the studio display, but it still looks really good, has good color accuracy if you play around with the settings a little bit. I, I'll try to find a link to someone with some, some suggested settings, but I think it's a really good option if you're looking to not spend over a thousand dollars on a monitor. You want it to be really bright, you want it to be really crisp, you want it to have high refresh, and if you're going to be plugging anything besides a Mac into it, if you're going to be plugging a gaming system into it, it's going to work great and I think it'll be a really good fit for you. So that's it. That's my first look. It's not really a review, kind of a review, I guess. I don't know. It's my look at the Sony InZone M9. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like button and I'll see you here next time. Bye-bye.